Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross shall shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock, and he established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives, now and forever. Amen. O 
Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast, the exaltation of your holy cross, a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young. Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense, which we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us. 
that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Qadishat Allah Qadishat Khayalaton Qadishat Lama Yahuta sign of your cross, Lord, you ordain your holy priests, and they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Join with others in being imitators of me, and observe those who conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. For many, as I have often told you, and now I tell you even with tears, that they conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is their destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly bodies and to conform them with his glorified body by the power that enables him to bring all things into subjection to himself. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, whom I love and whom I long for, my crown and my joy, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, beloved. Praise be to God always.
Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaim life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, If anyone says to you then, Look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they will perform signs and wonders so great as to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told this to you beforehand, so that if they say to you, he is in the desert, do not go out there. If they say, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For just as lightning comes from the east and is seen as far as the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And wherever the corpse is, there the vultures shall gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with great power and with great glory. And he will send out his angels with a trumpet blast, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. This is the truth, peace be with you. For many walk, of whom I have told you, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So this Sunday is about the past, and it's about the future, and how we live it in the present. It's about the past, because today coincides with the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. It has to do with the future because of the reading in the epistle, where St. Paul reminds the Philippians that our life is oriented towards the heavens, towards that existential existence that we call heaven, not the sky, but to God. And he says it's from there that we are awaiting the appearance of our Lord in his glory, the Savior who will bring the full restoration and transfiguration of us, conforming. He even makes up a word. Morphos in Greek means a shape or a form. Our word morphology, morphos. So he makes a word up called synmorphon, with shaping, 
And so it's not a Greek, it's, it's a Greek word, but he makes it, it's a neologism. It's one of these new words. St. Paul does this actually quite often in his letters, trying to describe something about the gospel, which in human terms is kind of nutty. So you have to make up a new term vocabulary to get it. So in this term, he says that when our Lord appears, we will be made simorphon. We will be made like form to him in his glory. So that's the future. And he's reminding us that's where our eyes are supposed to be set every single day. Every single moment of the day is waiting for that moment. That's the Maranatha, Morantha. Our Lord is coming. That ecclesiastical, liturgical term that we've talked about. Amen, Alleluia, Hosanna, these terms. What we used to have to also had the, the Aramaic, Moranatha. Moran is our Lord. You hear it in the beginning of every Mass, Moran, our Lord. And Moran Tha, Tha, it's I think the second line down below on that side. It means he's coming, he comes. Moran Tha, Moranatha means he's our Lord is coming. Because that is the vision in the letter to the Philippians. Now the past because St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi set the world on fire in the 13th century. He is not a hippie. He is not a proto-ecologist. He is a man who has and brings into the world a touch of Eden, a touch of what paradise was meant to be. That's why he communicates with animals, not because he's the Green New Deal, but because he is in a restoration of the original Adam who communicates with creation around them. And so it's normal, and in fact, when you see these stories, or even St. Anthony of Padua, he's in town trying to teach the gospel to people, doesn't matter if it's the Middle Ages, human nature is always the same, generation after generation, sadly so. And so when St. Anthony is preaching in town and everyone's like, oh, this is so boring. He's like, fine, shakes the dust off of his shoes, walks down to the Kennebec River, stands on the two cent bridge and starts catechizing the river. And the ducks stop. And then what happens is the fish start poking their heads up through the water to the humiliation of everyone in town because then Anthony could say, you see, these stupid animals are smarter than you. They hear the word of God. But prior to that is St. Francis of Assisi, and that's the idea of the bird singing and his communication with his wolf and everything else. It's not about ecology, it's about the original harmony that existed within creation and original justice. That is what we call the garden. That is what we call paradise. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's not just about a place, it's about an existential state of harmony in which original creation was set. But for Francis to arrive at that level, he has to do some very radical things as a young man. Now we won't go into details about his life because we're just talking about the one past moment. Famously, he belongs to a family that has, money. his father is a very successful businessman, they have money. And we always think of him walking around in the ratty old coat with the rope tied around it, barefoot. But in fact, he was born into a very affluent family. His father was a businessman. And it's precisely that affluence which causes the conflict between his father, Peter, and himself. It's because Francis goes through a conversion process. And he begins to see and awaits the coming of our Lord in glory that St. Paul talks about in the Philippians today. And of course, the famous episode is about him being, taking care of his father's shop. A beggar comes in and he does what everyone does. Get out of here, I'm busy. Don't you see we've got customers here? And so he does that, but he's struck by the fact. So the man just leaves the store. But as soon as he finishes with this client, he goes running through the streets to find the man to help him. And that is the moment of Francis's transformation. Because he begins then after that to start using you know, his father's stuff to start helping the poor. And so we said it causes the conflict between father and son because Pietro, 
tells his son, stop giving away the things from the shop. What father would not say the same thing? But not every father has the same child, Francis, who's like, hmm, I'm, this has changed now. This is totally different. And so he opposes his father on that, part because he's a teenager, partly because he's going through a conversion process. And his notion is, is that these things should be able to help others. Dad, we have more than we need. This is not, this is not accepted by his father. And so it comes to this clash where his father takes his son to court to make him pay back everything he's wound up giving away already from out of the shop to these beggars in the streets. And it's the very famous episode. It's an ecclesiastical court. The judge is the bishop. And it's the very famous scene where Francis finally says, basically, enough of this. I have one father who is in heaven, and at that point begins to start taking off all of his clothes in the middle of the courtroom, and then says, here, you can even have my clothes back. And from that point on, I mean, the bishop's a little mortified by this, has to wind up taking a bit of his cloak to cover this naked teenager in the courtroom. And that becomes the moment in which Francis has unmoored himself, detached himself from all of the things in the world. And that is why he goes out in full freedom, wooing, as he called her, Lady Poverty. And that's why when Francis went out into the streets, he set everyone on fire. This complete detachment. There's a magnificent, there's a magnificent paintings when you go to Assisi showing, of course, St. Clair. St. Clair eloped. She climbs out the window of her parents' house to head off with Francis and his buddies who are living in the woods, essentially the woods, a run-down area around a broken-down chapel that the Benedictines said, yeah, if you want to do that, they build huts around it. They're running around barefoot in dirty old coats. Not dirty, but old coats. And Claire, from another affluent family, she's like, that's so cool. And their mother's like, you're not going to do this. And so she decides that she's going to do what teenagers do. I'm just going to go out in the middle of the night. My parents are old anyways. They all go to bed at 8 o'clock. So in the middle of the night, she's climbing out the window, and Francis is down there with the other men who are following him. And they're like, come on, Claire, this is wonderful. Come on. And so she comes down the stairs. They go off to their chapel, and Francis is the one who shaves her head, cuts her hair off, gives her the veil, and she becomes the beginning of what you know as the poor Claire's, these Franciscan sisters. And like I said, it sets everything on fire. Because then Claire's younger sister, Agnes, like, well, that is really awesome. And their parents are like, you are not doing this. And so you have a painting in Assisi, which is great. Because it, it's a painting, it's from the Middle Ages, it's very, very old. It's a painting of an altar with a woman, a nun, hanging on to the altar cloths and pulling and trying to hang on to the altar while she's being dragged away by other people because this is Agnes. So when Agnes runs after her sister and Francis and these other, Bruno and the rest of them, and they're out in the streets preaching about the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ and lady poverty and all of this, Claire's parents are like, we're not losing two. So they send some of the servants, you bring Agnes back here. She's too young, she's not ready for this, she's none of this, and plus this is nuts. This is why when St. Thomas Aquinas wanted to join the Dominicans, it was the same thing. These are orders that weren't founded in great, magnificent abbey and great lands and agricultural and having their whole endowment. No, no, these people were beggars. They're in the streets begging. Thomas Aquinas' great uncle was the emperor. The last thing we're going to have our son do, join religious life, that's fine. Go to Monte Cassino, go to the Abbey, you'll be abbot someday. That's, that's good, that's prestigious, that's respectable. Barefoot begging in the streets as a mendicant? Not my son. And of course, on that same basis, Mama, who is directly related to the emperor, has her son locked up in a tower trying to stop him from doing this with the Dominicans, because the Dominicans and the Franciscans start at the same time. So Francis, 
Of course, when the servants arrived there, Agnes is the reason for the painting, as they bring her away, and she physically is hanging on to the altar in this little rundown chapel as they drag her away. So there's a lot of really great stories surrounding St. Francis. And it's not just this idea where we kick off our shoes and we run, you know, through the streets. It's not a proto-Woodstock version. It's important to understand what's going on with these people. You know, they're not boomers before the boomers. They're quite sane in contrast to the boomer generation, of which I'm at the end, so yes, it's my accusation also, don't worry. But Francis is because he sees the light of heaven. And he understands that this world is very brief and this life is very short. And how do we live it? What do we do with our days? Do we woo lady poverty? Do we sing sun? Do we sing songs to sister, to sister sun and sister moon? These are canticles because Francis is seeing through creation, God. He sees the face of God. And the early Franciscans do the same thing. And so it is about the past because of today's feast day, to detach ourselves from the things that hold us down. Stand there and shake in front of our iPad because I have to turn it on again so I can watch and just start going for hours on end each day. We are so attached and addicted to these things. I have to turn on the computer. I have to do this. I have to just watch over and over again cable news. Yes, it says the same thing it said this morning. In fact, it says the same thing it said yesterday and the day before yesterday. And it's going to say the same thing tonight. And I sit there. I have to know this stuff. It's the same thing they told you yesterday and the day before yesterday. I have to do this. We are mesmerized, we are addicted, we are attached to these things. May St. Francis intercede for us to learn how to kick off those shoes, unplug those things, and to be free finally. This is what St. Paul is talking about in the middle of this reading to the Philippians today. He says, I have told you about these people among you. Again, he's talking about the baptized. He's not denouncing pagans. The pagans just do what pagans do, which isn't much other than sex. But the, with the Christians who have been baptized and sanctified, we have been given a vision and a light to see something different. That our conversation, our citizenship, our belonging is not first and foremost to the state of Maine or to the United States. St. Paul reminds us our citizenship by your consecration is already one foot with God. And so we are meant to live accordingly. When we stand there watching these screens and so attached to all of these things, I just have to know, I have to know, I have to know why. I'm not in charge. I couldn't change it if I wanted to. And St. Paul is saying the same thing here. He says, this is the quotation we began with. For I have told you about these people before. And now I'm telling you, crying. I don't know how to get this message across to you. I am in pain, I suffer, and I weep, and I have told you about them before. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. These are Catholics. He's not talking about pagans, remember. He's talking about the Christians who do not live the mystery of the cross. They live like any other person. And he says that makes them enemies of the cross. The cross and the resurrection have been revealed to them. And by the way they live, they show that they're at enmity with that mystery. And that's why he says their goal, their goal is destruction. They're on a path which is going to destroy them. Their attachments, psh, their God is their belly. All they do is talk about food. Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to have? What are we going to do for my sensual satisfaction? That's what he means when he says they're God. What do they serve? It's their belly. 
All you have to do is look at the world as it is. I mean, how many Americans? You know, part of the COVID panic is because we are all fat. And obesity makes us more liable to die from these respiratory diseases. This could not be more clearly laid out by St. Paul when he says their God is their belly. And he says their glory is in their shame. Things that they should be ashamed of, these Catholics, are things that they are proud of. So claims for all of these different rights, transgender, LGBT, all of these rights, rights, of rights to abortion, my rights, my rights. How many Catholics are on those picket lines? How many Catholics are signing those petitions? And he says what they glory in because I'm for human rights? He says their glory is their shame. They are totally out of whack with the gospel of salvation, totally out in disorder with the proper ordering of objective good and grace and healing. That's the meaning of this epistle today. St. Paul is reminding us that we have to look forward and move forward because our citizenship is already with God. Now he uses the term, be imitators of me. This is not because he's saying, I'm arrogant, and so am I not awesome, do what I do. No, he's saying, copy me. That's what imitation means. It's the action of copying. Imitare in Latin means to copy. And so when he's saying this, he's saying, look, I've gone through this. I've been smashed off my horse outside of Damascus. I've been blinded for three days outside of Damascus. I've gone through this process. Francis of Assisi, standing naked in the middle of the courtroom, he's gone through this detachment. Break those bonds, snap those chains, and to be free. And that's why St. Paul can say, as St. Francis would say, come on, Claire, yes, it's great on the other side. Break the chains. St. Paul is saying the same thing when he says at the beginning of this reading, be imitators of me. And the people who live in you, with you in Philippi, who are also doing the same thing, the model that you have among you, follow them. Of course, what he's saying in tears is that I would wish all of you would be as free as I am. And break those chains and detach yourself from the world. This is why as Catholics, we do not use the term liberal or conservative. If some of the conservative ideas jive with Catholicism, good for the conservatives. But also some of the liberal ideas jive with Catholicism too. Well, good for them. That's why Catholics are absolute basket cases in the United States these days in politics because they're like, well, which part do you try to side with? But the Catholic stands back and says, we are not bound by these worldly, earthly categories. We are bound by the Lord God and his revelation that we have in the sacred teachings of the catechesis. And if anyone else jives with that, well, good for them. We do not need that. This is important to find the freedom and that's why with St. Francis of Assisi as an example, this man was freer than a bird. I mean, this man found having absolutely nothing, absolute possession of all things in creation. How long will we be oppressed by the ways of the world? We must change this garment beforehand and this is what I want to leave you with, with St. Ephraim. In the Syriac tradition, so the sin mortifos, to be made like, model like, in the Syriac tradition, the spiritual life is clothing. It's to put on the garment of grace, to put on the robe of glory. It's very ancient. St. Paul uses this term for the resurrection. And it is the rabbinical commentaries on Genesis of God making garments for Adam and Eve. You change one letter in the Hebrew and it's changed from garments of skin, pelts, to garments of light. 
And so the rabbinical commentaries will use this. And for St. Ephraim, the whole reason why the divine word enters this world is to be able to redress and regarb humanity with glory. So this notion of changing, and today quite well with St. Francis of Assisi stripping off all of daddy's clothes, fine, you want them, have everything. The spiritual life is our movement to put on something different. And that's why any of the world's labels will always be to some degree unfitting for Catholics. The only title that fits us well fundamentally is children of God, adopted, transformed, Christified, which is why we're called Christian, to be made like Christ. And when our lives are focused on that and not the latest scandal that's going on on cable networks, we are free. Oh, you can be entertained by the cable networks. I'm not saying I never look at the news. It's amusing. But I'm not bound to it. Our minds would be driven nuts if we focused and centralized our lives on what's going on in any given generation. We are free. And we already have a conversation, a citizenship, which has one foot with God already fundamentally changed. We just wait to pass beyond the veil. We change our garments. We enter into that life of glory. And we thank God for having made us free. It's not according to the world's categories. We may elope. We may have to do really stupid things, climbing out windows, stripping naked in a courtroom. But isn't it wonderful to be free when we finally understand that the categories of this world are not our categories? The ways of thinking of the world are not our thinking, but are totally different. When we understand that, and we understand that freedom, we understand why the gospel transformed the pagan Greek Roman world. Because the Christians did not live by the categories of the pagan Greeks and Romans, they brought the gospel to the Greeks and the Romans and transformed that European world. So it doesn't matter what political card we want to play. We are still shackled to the categories of this world. So let us be free. Let us ask for the intercession of St. Francis of Assisi, that we may be clothed anew in a robe of glory, in the garment of light, as St. Ephraim calls it, so that we can bring freedom to others. But if we're shackled, we have nothing to offer into that life of salvation to anyone else, and the world will just spiral down into the toilet as it is doing. It's not by accident that the world is so disastrous today, the further and the further away we move from the message of the gospel. It's very logical. How do you stop it from going down? Not by political rallies. You stop it by being transformed, saints individually in our personal lives, and then communicate that freedom to those around us. That's why St. Paul finishes by saying to them, therefore, my beloved brothers, my sisters, my highly desired, I want to see you again, this affection that he has, my crown and my joy, you're everything. Hold fast, stand fast within the Lord. May St. Francis obtain for us that strength, that freedom, and that garment of light that we may bring freedom and redemption channeled through us to those around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from the light, true God from true God, true God. begotten God made, consubstantial with the Father. proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life Tell what Madame Heda Loho, what about a Loho da Paritaya? Rain of Silo Taiba Tok, a lot of light of my school, Hayat Loho, and a Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Honor their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Francis. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the repose of Mary's spouse. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God Almighty, Father, you are true in holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace. To the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to the spiritual, your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly, 
glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. transgressing your law. You sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By his saving passion he restored us to our original inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. And Sabe Lachmo Beda, Kori Shanto, O Barachu Kadesh, Waksoya Bertalmita, Kadamara, Sabachola Mehene, Kulho, Hono Denita, Fahuro. Dachlofaikon, Wachlof Sagie, Metachseo, Metihem, Hosoyon, Home, Wahoy, and Alam Alami. Alkoso domsiko men hamro men mayo Barahu kadesh Uyabil talmita koromara Sabishtaw mehne kulho Hono denita Demo dila di antiki hadato Dachlo faikun, wachlov sagiem, ete shedu metihem, hosoyon, haume wa hoyen an alam alamin. Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death, your bearing all your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy. 
sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor, opening, and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your Holy Church, established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back, those who have, bring back those who have strayed, that they may live in your fear, and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks, to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on the mountaintops and in caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, upon this holy altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs and confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Francis of Assisi, and all the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feasts. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those
those who have left this world and have gone to you, lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things, with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not but deliver us from the For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your Holy God, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life, O Lord our God.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who has saved us. Through him and with him glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.